Good morning, Robin. It's good to speak to you again. Hello, Andy. Good, uh, good to speak to you too. I hope you're well, sir. I hope you're well. Um, thank you very much again for giving your time to uh, to input into uh, the Democracy Commission. We're enormously grateful. Um, as, you, as you might know, the sort of context to to Kirkley's Council setting up the Democracy Commission is um, in many ways driven by what's happening uh, in the terms of constitutional reform across the United Kingdom and particularly um, regional devolution in England and um, in many ways the oversight of, of central government to the implications for local government in many contexts. Um, but I think the wider sort of framework is also is in many ways linked to what happened this summer with the European Union referendum and that general concern about citizen engagement with local democracy and the changing role of councillors um, within that. So, um, you know, your expertise uh, is, is genuinely valued. And I think one of the things that we are very keen to hear about, which your presentation will no doubt give us an overview of, is, is, is the fact that this isn't a conversation which is unique to the United Kingdom or to England, that um, questions around devolution are affecting many democracies across the world. And um, it would be good if you could start off by giving us a brief um, overview of your presentation. Fine. OK, Andy. Well, first of all, can I say thank you for inviting me to contribute to your work. Uh, can I congratulate you all on organising this commission? It's certainly the right thing to be doing, and uh, it really is very well timed, given the changes that you mentioned. And I also think that the terms of reference that you've set yourselves are, are really good. So uh, all power to your efforts. I think it's very important. Um, in terms of the presentation, if it's okay, I, know, I think the main thing is for me to respond to your questions to try and help address issues that you were interested in. But if I could just set the scene with this little presentation that I gave to the Local Government Association conference uh, in Bournemouth in July, because I think it happens to fit quite well with your, your interests. If I just, uh, have you got the PowerPoint or print of it available? For we have us? indeed, yes. yes. We, 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 okay. Got well, I'm not going to go through this laboriously, Andy. That, that's not a good idea. But if I just skip through some of the main points, uh, and then we can open up and go to Q&A. That's wonderful. Um, so starting off there, that's a nice photograph of Bristol. That's an aerial view of my city where I am now. Um, we did introduce a directly elected mayor to our city in 2012. That was a big new step for the unitary authority to take. And we've done some research, sort of before and after research, on what difference having a mayor in Bristol has made. So I could talk a bit about that later if that's, if that's helpful. Yes, that would be very um, helpful. So there's uh, some work on mayor, mayoral uh, changes in Bristol. I've got a book out there that's about leading the inclusive city, which is a more international uh, study of city leadership in different countries. Um, perhaps we could draw on that. But I think the third, uh, the third slide is the one that's perhaps most relevant to the devolution debate. That's just the cover of the report that the LGA has now put on the uh, Devo Next website. That I, must say, I must say I work very closely with the uh, LGA on doing this work, so I want to acknowledge the, the, the real good help I've got from them. Hmm. It was actually the City Regions Board, chaired by Sir Richard Leith, who uh, in, uh, invited me to take on this study, and I worked with them in developing the report, so it's a bit of a collective effort. Um, the next slide is the devolution time of thing. I think we can, I think you're all familiar with this, but it it does really start back with the, um, in 2009 with the last Labour government coming forward with the idea of combined authorities. That was really the start of these changes. Then, as you know, we've had the coalition government moving forward with different steps, particularly the Heseltine review. Then the, um, the referendum in Scotland, I think, pushed the devolution agenda forward quite quickly because of concerns about change in Scotland being out of kilter with England. And then, as you all know, since the uh, election in uh, May 15, the Conservative government has pushed ahead with the Cities and Local Government Devolution Act. And uh, you're obviously very involved in reshaping the city region governance uh, in your area of 
the world. I think the LGA wanted uh, really to try and widen the conversation about subnational governance. I think the view was, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth here, but I think there was a view that the government was really stuck on one idea about how to govern city regions, that is, with a directly elected mayor for the city region, and that it really might make sense to just be a bit more open-minded about other options. So in the brief for the study, they wanted to uh, see some good examples of mayoral leadership, but also some examples where there was no directly elected mayor. So that was the background. I think for the, for the commission in Kirklees, the next slide, the principles of good governance, might, might only be the most useful because it really, it really links in quite closely with your terms of reference and ideas. Mm, so nice. with the City Regions Board, we came up with six criteria that we thought a good sub-national governance arrangement should deliver. So you can see them there, and they're in more detail in the report. Civic leadership, effective decision-making, transparency and efficiency, accountability, public involvement and business engagement. And then in the study, uh, I report on four examples, I'll speak them very quickly in a minute, of good, I think pretty good sub-national governance and they're each evaluated against those six criteria, so that just like a description, it's an attempt to say what's, uh, what's good, what's perhaps not so good about each model. Hmm. Is it okay if I just skip through the four? Just no, it's very, very helpful, then, thank then you. come back to questions? Yeah, that'd be very helpful, thank you. Okay, Andy, I'll just go, go, I'm not going to go in detail, but the first two examples, Auckland Council and the Greater London Authority, those are both models with a directly elected mayor. Mm. But they're actually very different. And I think that's one of the things to remember debate about mayors. There's not one fixed model. There's actually a, a, a great variety across the world of mayoral mm. models. The Auckland example is pretty radical. I've, I've included it at, at one end of the extreme where you just merge authorities together into one really big unitary and that's what they did. It was, I think it was eight councils were governing Auckland. And in 2010, they merged them into one big unitary council with a directly elected mayor. And then with what they call local boards within Auckland, Town 21, to uh, involve citizens in local decision making. Mm. So if you think uh, that's, that would like, be like Greater Leeds, it's one massive unitary with local boards within it. That's what they did in Auckland. It's a little bit of a radical one and may not appeal to, uh, to local authorities in, in England, but it is an option. The second one is the Greater London Authority. This is more familiar, uh, of course, because it's our own UK model introduced in 2000, where I think this model is highly respected around the world. It's worth saying that because you've got a strategic authority for the whole of Greater London you have a directly elected mayor, but you also have uh, constituency uh, members and London members. You have a, an assembly that holds the mayor to account. Meanwhile, the London boroughs continue to run most of the local government services, in, as I'm sure you all know. Mm. So there's two, lo two directly mayor, mayor, di elected mayor models. The, the next two, just quickly, have not got directly elected mayors, but they are really good models of sub-national governance. Portland Metro is in Oregon, where here to elect three well, three kinds of people. They have a president, they have constituency councillors, and that forms the strategic governance level. It's, this is a bit like the GLA. It's above the level of the municipalities. I think there are 28 mm. below the metro. So they're carrying on delivering local services, but the strategic authority, the metro, has uh, elected politicians. It also has an elected auditor. It's like an elected scrutiny chief to hold the president and the councillors to account. So uh, I think the model works, works well. The president does not have executive power. This is not a directly elected mayor. The president has to work in a very collective way with other councillors. So the president has power, can appoint people to different roles. But it's a more collegial model than a mayoral model. And I think
think Portland is particularly good at public engagement. And I know you're interested in that in the Commission. Mm. And it's on their website, and I've, I've recommended this to a few, a few different authorities, is that there's a public engagement guide that they've developed uh, over some time that could be quite useful to look at for details of how they do that. The last one, the uh, Association of the Region of Stuttgart in Germany, is another big city region governance arrangement. And here, um, as you probably know, in, uh, in Germany, they favour proportional representation. So the elected assembly is uh, uh, created by PR, and the councillors who are elected, I think there are 80, it's quite a large council, it's a very big area, but they then took their chair, rather like a conventional UK local authority, to be the, the chair of the region. Again, mm. the municipalities continue to govern uh, below the level of the city region authority. So I'll skip through those quite quickly. And there's lots of other models, to be honest, but these are in the report just to illustrate some, I think, quite well-respected models of government. So just to wrap up, the last slide then, as you can see, there are different models of subnational governance. There's no one model superior to others. I think they've got strengths and weaknesses. Mm. I think the headline in LGC when the report came out was something along the lines that you don't have to have a directly elected mayor, <laughs> which was a bit of a simplification of the city. But to be fair, that is one of the key findings. Uh, there's different um, balance of power between executive and assembly. Mm. Uh, so there's lots of scope there for you and your devolved governance to, to deal with that. But there are opportunities for citizen involvement. I've mentioned the Portland Public Engagement Guide. And if, I think you're onto this in the Commission. You need to include a variety of voices in civic leadership mm. and you need good scrutiny. So that's my whisk through the presentation. I hope I haven't gone through that too quickly, but it just might be useful. Now, of course, the, what's nice about the timing here, it's all written up, so the detail behind these models can be looked at in the report. But uh, with that, I think I'll hand back to you, Andy, and I'm happy to take any questions either about the report or the mayoral model in Bristol or uh, any, any issues at all. Well, Robin, that's enormously helpful. Um, just to um, give you an idea about who else is in the room, I'm, I'm joined today by three of the uh, commissioners drawn from the uh, council, uh, Katie's council itself, and I think they should, would like to uh, introduce themselves first. Jennifer, want to... Okay, thank you. Hi, Robin. I'm Gemma Wilson, one of the councillors and member of the Democracy Commission. I was elected last year, so fairly new to the council still. Okay, thank you. Hello. Yeah, uh, Andrew Marchington, uh, also a Kirklees Council member of the Commission, and I've been a councillor for about 12 years now. Okay, thank you. And uh, Eric Firth from Dewsbury, um, a member of the Commission, and I've been elected member for, uh, some people say too long, but it's uh, <laughs> uh, 20 years, 20, over 20 years now. Okay, excellent. Thank um, you for that. We're also joined by uh, various uh, wonderful officers from Kirklees Council as well, who've been, uh, as you quite rightly noted, uh, very proactive in setting up the Commission and also in establishing the terms. And I think that uh, the comments you made are, are ones that I've already made, that they are both timely in setting up the Commission and also in establishing uh, appropriate terms um, for yes. our inquiry. Um, just to... Just to um, to start off and to think about um, your presentation and the different case studies you've undertaken, um, you mentioned the principles of good governance, those six um, principles that you identified. Yes. Um, how important do you think each of these factors is when developing a, um, a regional governance model? And I'm thinking about that obviously in the context of what's happening in Yorkshire, West Yorkshire, Greater Yorkshire, Lesser Yorkshire, or whatever form of Yorkshire emerges as a combined authority. I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the question in that regard. Oh, right. Sorry. I was just wondering if you'd like to just sort of talk through and just sort of discuss what you think, you know, these, you know you've identified these important factors. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about each one in terms of developing an appropriate model of regional governance for West Yorkshire. Or yeah, for absolutely, Yorkshire. got it. Thank you. Uh, I think just before, and I can say a little bit about each of the six, but um, 
maybe the, the, the context again is worth emphasizing. We do live in a very centralized state, and mm. I, I want to really emphasize this. In my last job, I was uh, working in Chicago. I was at the University of Illinois, uh, the big public university in the middle of the big, uh, big city region of Chicago. And uh, I came back from working there in 2007. And this is just a bit of a personal or not, but I, I do remember being really quite deeply shocked about how centralized the UK state had become. I, I, I guess I thought it was centralized before I went in you know, 02. Mm. When I came back, uh, it, I, I really did realize then, uh, in a way that I hadn't realized before, who, uh, it's absolutely remarkable the degree of control central government exercises over local government in, mm. in the UK. But obviously we're talking about England, let's talk about England today. Um, it is extreme. There's no other country that I've worked with that does this, and I think it's holding the country back. And to be blunt, I think the efforts to bring about devolution do not go anywhere near far enough. I think we need a lot more power locally. Can I just ask you, Robin? On that Sorry. point, can I just ask yeah. on that point, because it is, it, 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 it's, it's a well-recognised point that England is over-centralised, why do you think that Westminster has been so reluctant to devolve power within England in the way that it has done in other parts of the United Kingdom? Right. I, I, think, what, I think often these steps, these centralising steps, I used to work in local government, by the way, many happy years ago, many happy, from quite a few years I think the steps towards centralisation are often very incremental. So individual mm. central governments at different times, I'm going right back to Labour in the 70s, actually, and then through the Thatcher years, particularly the Thatcher years taking a lot of control. I think each individual step perhaps didn't appear to be that significant on its own, but if you keep piling on changes mm. and removing powers, you, you weaken the, 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 the whole democratic base of the, of the country. Why it's different in uh, the different parts of the UK really stems from political movements at the local level pressing for change. I think this is a story that could be quite positive. So the new Labour government in 97 realised that it really had to do something about the voices from Wales and Scotland. So they did. And the, the devolution to the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly was really quite a radical effort to decentralise power. I think we should recognise Labour did make a major step there. But they didn't do much to, <laughs> about England, as you know. Mm. And we've continued this creeping centralisation. So I'm, I, I, on a more optimistic note, I'm hoping that these new arrangements can provide local authorities with a platform for pushing for more power. And that over a period of time, and you mentioned the, uh, the European Union referendum and the, the turbulence that we're now in, uh, the optimistic view would be that we can really sp uh, take some steps to speak to those concerns and use it to, to re-empower local, uh, local authorities mm. and obviously city regions. So that would be my general argument. Thank you. If I just go to the sixth then, I think the first one is the most important, the civic leadership. You might, you might think, oh, well, I would say that because I'm particularly, that's my area of work is working on civic leadership. But... Um, if you, leadership can develop the capacity uh, of an area, develop a vision for the area, and can really, I think, foster and encourage and develop civic pride. I think, it, I think we've under it, uh, and I think the idea of mayors is part of that discussion, but it doesn't have to be directly elected mayors. Mm. But I think you want a model of governance in your city region that does have strong effect leadership and then the other five criteria that come in really underpin good leadership you can't be just have good leadership without these other qualities I think mm. so the um, effective decision making is about having uh, sound arrangements for making decisions and also for having adequate deliberative debates about the decisions so it's not just about being a business like corporation mm. that, does things, as you know, it's a, it's a democratic institution. And that takes you into the transparency, which is fundamental. And I am a little worried about the devolution deals that we've been witnessing around the country, because they've been really mainly been done behind closed doors with a, a, a lack of transparency. I've been quite critical of 
the government on that. I don't think that's a good idea because I don't think it builds trust and confidence, really. Mm. On accountability, um, I think you, you said you heard me mention the models in the report. They do all have some direct election to that regional level, the sub-regional level, which the current arrangements for combined authorities don't. It's all indirect, isn't it? So you'll have councillors from the constituent areas serving on the, the new um, combined authority. I'm not sure that's good enough for democratic accountability myself, mm. but that, that's perhaps a debate to be had that in the future we may need to go for direct election. Um, not necessarily like London, but as you know, the London Assembly members are held to account and the mayor is held to account at the ballot box. Mm, yeah. uh, that's two. Then public involvement, um, you do need to have strong arrangements for that, and I think your commission can break new ground here. Uh, I think there's a lot of experiment going on, but we need more. Uh, I think the idea of devolved governance to areas within the city region is important because people are often more concerned about their immediate locality. I know yeah. the councillors in the room will know more about that than I do. Their local communities' interests are often focused on very specific issues, and that is important. Um, lastly, business engagement. When I worked in local government, we were not good at business engagement at all. In fact, it was neglected. We didn't really see it as important. I'm back in the 70s, the <laughs> early 80s, I guess. Um, and that's changed a lot now. We do see some quite good practice, I think, in some of the uh, local enterprise uh, partnerships of speaking to and working with business interests. And there's, there's a room to do more of that, uh, and that's, that's really important in the new arrangements, I think. Something mm. that's quite strong in Bristol, just going to my own experience here, I think that's improved quite a bit. So that's a quick run through those principles. I think there's more detail in the report mm. than each one. Now that's enormously helpful. Thank you for that. I just want to go back to that point um, one where you were talking about civic leadership and quite rightly saying that it is the most important element yeah. of, the, uh, of the principles of good governance. To what extent do you think that England has lacked that civic leadership in the way possibly that we've seen in other parts of the United Kingdom to push forward the devolution agenda? Well, I think if you go right back, we can be very proud uh, of the, uh, if we go back to the origins of local government and the Victorian leaders mm. uh, in the big cities, and uh, this includes uh, all of them, the big northern cities, who were just, just remarkable people, the elected councillors, who changed the governance and the constitution of the country by asserting the importance of place, that's the way I would put it, and campaigning, obviously. Chamberlain in Birmingham often gets mentioned in this mm. context, but there are a lot of other great leaders. Then you have, and I think Michael Heseltine put it, I think he put this right, that from that heyday we've had, a, I think he called it a century of centralisation. <laughs> in other words, over quite a long time we've weakened local government. I think a century is probably not quite right because the local government gained power after World War II uh, and the welfare state grew. So I think, mm. with the, I think the centralisation has been more this last... 25, 30 years. But um, I, I think the, I don't think we can criticise individuals here. I think there's been a, a shift where Whitehall has become more assertive in controlling what happens in localities in England. And uh, it, it, it's been very effective at getting its own way. And I still think it is doing that through the devolution deal. So mm. the challenge is, is, quite, uh, is quite big, I think, to try and reverse that trend. But we need to do it, and it may be that Brexit is a prompt to that, 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 that even Whitehall realises it has to devolve more uh, power to be successful. So you think the failure, particularly in the northeast of England, is reflective of possibly a strengthening of that civic leadership outside of Whitehall? I, I don't know the data. I know the devolution deal in the northeast is... is is in choppy waters, let's put it that way. I think some of the councils are not to join it, uh, and some still want to go ahead. But uh, as I understand it, they're, they're, they're really saying, we're not getting, the ones who are opting out, are saying, well, we're not really getting much out of this deal, and mm. therefore we're not going to do it. And to be honest, I've looked a bit at the figures, uh, certainly for Bristol. The sums coming through the devolution deals compared with the cuts to local government spending, I'll 
exceptionally small. Mm. Uh, 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 Chancellor Osborne <coughs> was able to speak a lot about de devolving power in these new budgets, but um, it's really it's really trivial uh, the level of spending that's coming through that route compared with the cuts. Mm. And the government's managed to get that across to the media. I'm surprised it's not being exposed more. Mm. Now that's an interesting point. I'm going to bring my fellow councillor after I've asked yes. just one more question, which is um, around this notion of civic leadership and particularly around the mayoral model. Now we know that the current government under Theresa May seems less enthused than David Cameron and George Osborne were about directly elected mayors. Yes. But I, I wonder whether you'd like to expand, you know, looking at, on the basis of the case study work that you've done, on your views on the mayoral model and um, give us some examples of where it's worked well or possibly even less well. Fine, okay. Um, I think the work we were able to do in Bristol is relevant to this. I say we, I'm, I, I'm at the University of the West of England, mm. but I've worked with my colleague David Sweeting, who's a lecturer at the University of Bristol. So the two universities have worked together with the city council and with the other interests in the city to do this study. And if I just simplify it, um, it is true that the individual you elect as mayor makes a difference on how the model performs. Mm. So that, that, that matters. We've tried to evaluate the model independent of who's actually the individual who's the mayor. It's not, it's not easy to do that, but I think you, you have to acknowledge individuals can and, and should make a difference. The arguments in favour, and I think there's some quite good evidence in Bristol uh, for this, is that the leadership of the city is visible. People now know who is the leader of the city in a way that's spectacularly different from before. Mm. Well, we've got survey data on this. Um, and if you think that matters, and I, I think it probably does if you don't know who's leading, how do you hold them to account? That's quite a strong argument. Mm. Um, I think the mayors, I've done work with mayors here in Britain but also abroad, I think the, act of, the process of direct election gives those individuals a high level of legitimacy to do things and it actually gives them a bit of confidence to take tough decisions that would be difficult if they were not directly elected. Mm. Uh, I think that's quite an important argument and some councillors who've been both, like Sir Peter Salisbury, the mayor of He's the Labour Mayor of Leicester, as you probably know. Yeah. He, uh, Peter was the leader of the council before, if you go back in time. So he can make a judgment about the difference of being a leader. And he was a throng leader, as compared with being a directly elected mayor. And he, he, he's on record, uh, is chalk and cheese. That being a mayor, being directly elected, gives you this authority to lead. Mm. Uh, I know uh, a couple more points are in favour, then I'll go on the against. Um, you can have stable leadership if you have a four-year term. I know in your terms of reference, if you're looking at electoral cycles and so yeah. on, I think it was a really good idea in Bristol to go for four-year terms. Before mm. we introduced a mayor, it was a one-third of the councillors each, each year and then a year off. So you've got this constant change, really, or potential change. Now we know the council was elected in May this year. We've got a new Labour mayor, Marvin Rees, and the council for, for four years and uh, Marvin is working with a cabinet with members from different parties in the cabinet that was in, that was an idea introduced by our last mayor George Ferguson mm. so I think we kind of know who's going to run the place for four years then in 2016 there'll be another reflection and we'll decide as citizens if we want that model uh, those people to carry on or new people can I just go to the against because I think there are some arguments against mm. um, and it, in the research in Bristol did show this, you, there is a risk that you concentrate too much power in the hands of one individual. That's, I think, the key argument against directly elected. It's also, in a way, one of its strengths. Yeah. But you can imagine if uh, someone gets authority uh, and then just decides, I'm going to do it my way, uh, and doesn't listen much, that can be damaging and you can get misguided policy. And I have I think of a few examples in the US where that's that's the case. Mm. You can't get rid of them, you know, four years or whatever it is. The Boris Johnson uh, effect. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I think there's, a, there's an argument that 
the model encourages, I call it celebrities, to put themselves mm. forward for political leadership. Oh, my and, that, yeah. and that this might be a bad thing because you start focusing on the individual personalities of, of people rather than the policies they stand for. Mm. And it, uh, there's one or two examples of that in different countries. Uh, I think there's a quite effective now who was a, a wrestler, for example. And, and I'm not saying people with different backgrounds can't be good leaders, but mm. we need to be a bit careful with that. Um, I think also, uh, maybe going back to the earlier point, if you have them there in your city region, does that alter the local central relationship or not? Some people argue having a mayor isn't the key point. We need more power for our locality. Mm. And the, uh, the Whitehall is still running things, even if you have a directly active mayor. Mm. So those are my quick thoughts on the mayoral model of pros and cons. Now that's enormously helpful. Thank you very much for that. I'm just going to bring in uh, Councillor Wilson. Hi, Robin. Hi. Looking at um, the conversation we just had and your experience, obviously your fantastic academic and professional experience, which really is incredibly helpful to us, but also your experience as a citizen actually living in a city where there is the, the mayor model, yeah. What do you feel that the role of councillors within that model is? Um, do you feel that there's greater opportunities for councillors? Do you feel that councillors are perhaps losing power or perhaps losing a respect in that there's another layer that, that is brought in as well? Yes, I can answer that very directly. Uh, we, uh, and I don't want to criticise individuals here, but we've had the, a different, we had Mayor George Ferguson was the mayor, and he did not take too much time to work closely with councillors. I think he mm -hmm. felt that the arrangements for governing the city needed to change and the mayor needed to shake things up. And that had good good things happening as a result of thing on the downside. And I've spoken to Mayor Ferguson about this and it's in our report. Um, many councillors became very frustrated that they were being excluded from decision making. So uh, you're looking to raise that question, councillor. Um, we have now uh, a new mayor, Marvin Rees, elected in May, who has a very different style of leadership. So you have somebody in the same office, the same power, the same positional power, but a much more inclusive approach uh, to working with councillors. So I, I think my answer to the question there is a lot depends on the leadership style of the individual who is mayor but it's also in uh, the checks and balances that you design into the governance arrangement. So in Bristol, we're, uh, our mayor arrangements are under the Localism Act 2011, and that does give quite a lot of power, uh, positional power anyway, to the mayor, not, not fiscal power, as you know, but uh, that can be misused. So you, you might need to look at how to ensure councillors' voices are listened to by a mayor. Thank you. And just wanted as well, what was your turnout like for the mayoral elections? As, um, I found that when I've been speaking to, to residents in my area, you know, not that many people are massively interested in it, but it seems quite a negative response in that it just feels like another committee, another talking shop, another layer of, of governance that's set up. I just wondered if that was reflected, if people were actually engaged in the mayoral ideas uh, and people yes. were actually keen uh, to be involved and saw a value. Yeah, I can uh, try and answer that one. I think a lot depends on the politics of the city, uh, mm. and uh, it might be a bit difficult to generalise. But certainly when we had the first mayoral election in 2012, uh, that was seen as quite exciting and different. So there were 15 mm. candidates. I think we had more, more than mm. uh, for any other mayoral election. Obviously the main parties, but some really quite solid independent candidates, mm. including Mayor Ferguson, who won. Mm. Uh, he does not belong to a party, but also some colourful characters making their own mark. So I think the campaign raised interest, and the annual lectures of the mayor, uh, it was Mayor Ferguson, but it will be the same for Mayor, mayor Rees, are very well attended. Over 600 people come to those meetings. Uh, it's the big civic hall in the University of Bristol where it's the mm. only building that can get, get everyone in. So in terms of the active citizen, I think we've seen quite a high level of engagement with this new model. But you're quite right about the turnout. Our voter turnout 
in England in local elections is the, the worst in Europe. I, I slow down a little because we're very, very poor on the league tables. Everywhere is better than us. Um, so uh, there's something wrong here. And I go back to the centralization of the state. I think we've weakened local government so much that all local elections have got a low turnout now in, in England, relatively. So um, we have to be careful what we read, but I think the voter turnout in the May election this year for the mayor and the councillors, it was all on one day, I think it was 43%, which was yeah. an increase on the previous one. Yeah, so there's a tiny bit of, of evidence that voter turnout is going up a little bit, but I don't think mayor can drive up high voter turnout without having more powerful local <coughs> government. Thank you. So they're not a panacea to the problems of local democracy turnout in themselves. There is a, a wider need for empowerment of the position, you think, to probably produce that greater pu public engagement. Yeah, I, I, th I think you can't... Don't, uh, I think some people will rather hope, oh, if we only have a directly elected mayor, that voter turnout will go up a lot and problems will be solved. That's not, that's not a good argument. It's much more complicated than that. But a good mayor can, can uh, stimulate interest in new ways. Perhaps just on you, you know, use of social media, this is a bit controversial, but Mayor Ferguson, well, I mentioned he did not work very well with his councillors. I think that was a mistake. But he was very good at getting out on the street, so mm. he'd ride his bike and would be seen around the city a lot. But he also used Twitter all the time. I don't know how many followers he had. But uh, he became very effective in using social media to explain what he was doing, and I think that that was quite attractive to some people. Mm. Um, so th there might be some options there for, for Kirklees ahead. He was also sartorially very expressive as well. <laughs> 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 yes, um, Andrew. Uh, yeah, thank you, Robert. Um, looking at the relationship between the um, in the different models you've looked at bet between the whatever the executive is, whether that's the mayor or the board or the council, and the local councils underneath, say the local boards or the municipal boards, how does that work play out? I mean, given the the mayor needs to make strategic decisions, you've still got that still needs to link down to the local level, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Are you talking here about within, say, within Kirklees, or about the city region? Well, try to look at what the re a future relationship might be, because, again, you've got the example in Auckland, you know, you've got the, mm -hmm. um, so the mayor and the council, but then you've got the local boards. Yes. Uh, yeah. right, you've still got the, um, the London boroughs. It's that relationship between the mayor and what potentially it might look in a West Yorkshire city region. Right, OK. Um, we will, well, uh, if things stay as they are, we in, we call it the West of England, I'm not sure it's a very good name, but this is the grouping of authorities in, call it Greater Bristol. We'll have a combined authority next May with a directly elected mayor for, call it a city region. So some people have said, oh, surely this will be confusing. We've got a mayor for Bristol, and then we're going to have another mayor for, it's actually three unitary authorities. Uh, it's Bristol, South Gloucestershire, and Bath and North East Somerset. There'll be another mayor for that level. And is, is this going to be uh, confusing to everyone? Um, my answer to that is no. And I think uh, citizens are quite uh, able to distinguish the different roles up to a point. Mm. So in London, you have a Greater London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, now. And if you lived in, say, Lewisham, mm. you'd be familiar with the directly elected mayor of Lewisham, that's Steve Bullock. So it's okay to have two lots of mayors, is what I'm saying. I think we've got that in London, and it's not, uh, that's not a real, I don't think that's a difficult at all, and good mayors work together. Um, but going back to your point about the, uh, the local boards, I think that is really important, and uh, maybe Auckland is a good example, because it's one new, uh, big unitary. There were fears that the mayor and the cabinet around there would become very distant from the localities within what's quite a big city. I think it's about 1.25 million population, so it's not an absolutely massive city, but it's pretty big. So the local boards, uh, the 21 boards, have powers to make decisions relating to the local areas within Auckland that are 
come those street level things that matter to local people, not devolve an enormous amount of power, but there is quite a bit that matter to local people around uh, street maintenance, parks, mm. community facilities, so on. But um, for Kirk Lees, that might be quite an important topic because um, you've got quite a, uh, in, in English local government, there's quite a lot of functions are run by Kirk Lees now, even with the bubble, uh, spending cuts. So there might be uh, new ideas for how control of those is shaped by local ward councillors. Uh, some places have area committees and uh, or community-based arrangements. Um, and I think that could be, if, if you may be doing this already, forgive me if this is already uh, in hand, but that will, I think that will become even more important in a, in a city region model, so if you're going to keep in touch with local people. Mm, thanks. Just, just to sort of, um, Eric's going to come in, but just a quick question, Robin, on, on this role of the local councillor. Do you, do you find that there is a difference in the way in which regional devolution has affected that role in what has emerged, such as Auckland, as a unitary framework, and then possibly other arrangements, such as in London or, or, or um, in Stuttgart, where you have uh, a multi-level framework? Do you think that that affects it? Thinking about it in the context that in England at the moment it seems to be the government is preferring this multi-level approach towards our regional devolution. Yes, I think, I suppose it, it, I think it could create more demands on councillors. Um, I, don't, I don't want to say it was very simple back in the day, but it, it, I think the, the government structures were simpler and the responsibilities perhaps were a bit clearer. Mm. You represent your ward, you represent your party, you deal with your case, well, you're, a, you're an advocate for the place that elected you. I think we've seen some really good practice in different cities in, uh, in England, I'll talk about England for a minute, uh, uh, rural areas as well. Uh, councillors are, some people talk about community capitalists, I think it's quite a nice phrase, the idea of the mm -hmm. councillor being someone who's not just a representative on the council, but an activist who helps different um, organisations work together for the benefit of that small area that they, they're concerned with. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I can see that uh, being a good thing and, be, uh, and developing quite well in some places. Um, whether the new regional arrangements make that kind of action more difficult depends on how much power rests at the different levels. So maybe to go to London just for a moment, uh, that was always seen, the Greater London Authority, was always seen as a strategic authority, and it's really transport, spatial planning, strategic mm. spatial planning and economic development laid on top of the London boroughs with the London boroughs doing most of the really important public service work with education, and social services, housing, planning and so on. Um, and I think that quite well in London. I think mm. that you, you've got people in Lambeth or Lewisham or wherever identify with their particular part of London and much of the decision making that affects them in that area is, is locally based. So mm. I think in your new city region you, you could take a little bit of comfort from what's happened in London um, if there was a new, well, when there is a strategic combined authority, uh, if that can be strategic uh, and not be trying to interfere in the details of how Kirk Lees is governed, it, it would be good. No, that's very helpful. Oh, thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you very much. You, you've given us uh, much to think about. I've been scribbling like mad on, uh, <laughs> okay. on my bits of paper. Uh, but as we're aware, um, we're, we're looking at a almost a new life for, for governance, uh, but at the same time, um, government continues to emasculate local government uh, by death by a thousand cuts almost, by reducing uh, what we can do uh, with the limited amount of money that we have. And yet we're yeah. talking about devolution uh, and, and grant, granting lots of money and lots of powers to the new um, uh, assembly, well, we won't have an assembly in West Yorkshire because that's already been poo pooed, I believe, uh, oh, really? by, okay. by, by certain other leaders. It's been suggested, by the way, by Kirk Lees, and I, I, I don't think it's been welcomed, shall I say, by some other leaders. Hmm. Uh, so at the moment, um, the West Yorkshire Combined Authority has uh, five leaders from West Yorkshire plus York and uh, some opposition members uh, on there. 
but as you said, they've been um, sent there, if you like, by their own local authorities. Um, right. Do you think this model can continue, or, or will the public ultimately or eventually demand elections? Well, I think you put your finger on something that really is of fundamental importance here, isn't it? I think elected leaders govern by consent, don't they? And if people start to feel that this is some distant, mysterious organisation that's not transparent um, and they don't quite know who's, who's doing what, uh, that could be quite worrying. And I do, I do want to mention there's a couple of reports come out by, from Parliament where, where different committees have looked at the arrangements being put together through DO deals mm. and they've been very critical on, on exactly the argument uh, you've made that the people that will not, non, people do not understand who does what in the new combined authority arrangements mm. and uh, the indirect election process um, might not be adequate for ensuring accountability for these new arrangements. So it's almost like, I do think this is a, a problem, it's almost like we're redesigning the constitution of the country without a proper debate about it. It's the, the, the deals are being done and then there's a new combined authority that, that well, really have the, the legitimacy that it needs to exercise leadership for the city region. So I am concerned about that. So I'd encourage you to, to press on that. It might be you can't do much by let's May, let's assume your combined authority does start let's May. Oh, by the way, I've suggested, I'm, I've written an article, the whole process should be put back one year, and that we should have the elections to combined authorities in May 18. That's mm. my suggestion. I've got no political uh, power at all, but it's, I, I just think we, we could think this all through and have a much better designed combined authorities if we did that. Mm. Um, it might even be that that does happen, because I think getting all the orders laid uh, to, to enable the elections next May might be a struggle, uh, just for practical reasons. But, uh, sorry, that's a long way of trying to answer your question, but I do, I do think that you should be thinking about more, de uh, more democratic arrangements for that city region level of governance. And an easy example to quote in making that argument would be Greater London. Uh, you could, I'm not saying you want to have the same as London, but just to make the point that we've got a successful model in our country with direct, a directly elected second tier of, uh, of governance that's not, not thousands of councillors, there's 25 London mer uh, members for a city of 8 million people. So you wouldn't be looking for a big, large number of councillors, really. You, I, I think you'd be looking for something re relatively small, but they would be directly elected and visible. Mm, yeah, you, that would no, be where the thinking might want to go. Might yeah, I, I think some, some people are, are thinking about the almost um, resurrecting the York County Council, uh, whereby there will be quite a lot of members elected. But can I ask, can I just continue yeah, with okay. Robin, if, yeah, you don't, if you don't mind, uh, yeah. about the involvement of the LEPs, because uh, yeah. you haven't touched on that. And, yeah. uh, in the uh, West Yorkshire Combined Authority, we do uh, work closely and have a good relationship uh, with the LEP. Uh, and I do know some other Combined Authorities uh, I'll try and keep them at a distance, which I think is a mistake. Can I have your opinion on that, please, Robin? Well, uh, uh, I'm on your side, straight, down, straight off the bat. I, no, I think you, you do need to work closely with the LEP. Um, I think I learned quite a bit about this when I was in, in uh, Chicago. Um, I think there's a bit of, uh, how can I put it, social, cultural forces here. I think in Britain, and I, I speak about my own experience here a little bit, I say in local government back in the day, we did not work very closely with business. It wasn't seen as something needed to do. We had to deliver really good public services uh, in local areas. Uh, I think in other countries, and certainly in the US, I think there was more of an understanding that the local economy matters for the quality of life place. So that uh, businesses have been more involved in local government in the US historically than, we, than they have been in Britain. But I think what's happened in the last perhaps 15, 20 years up pretty fast and uh, I, I like I, I, I'm pleased to hear what you say about the way you are working with the lab 
um, because you do want prosperous businesses in your area and uh, I think local government can help and out about and I think I can see this being much more effective across the country really in working with business. Um, I think local businesses perhaps need to learn a bit more about the wider social uh, responsibilities but uh, 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 the main point is you want them to prosper economically and working closely with them is important. So uh, I would emphasise that and I would say in a, in a way I think uh, Britain's uh, historically not been doing that but has improved quite a lot but as you say not everywhere I think in some places the LEP, the LEP is viewed with suspicion and that's probably not very helpful. Mm, thank you. That's just to sort of go back to that question, Robin, about um, public engagement, public knowledge about um, the direction of regional devolution and its implications for local democracy. Now, one of the main criticisms have been is that the consultations undertaken by emerging um, combined authorities has been post hoc, has been rather coarse in its range, and doesn't really have any ability to affect the outcomes of what's happening at the moment. Now, you mentioned in um, your presentation that you, in, in Portland and in other areas there was you know, some good examples of these governmental structures engaging well with the wider public. I just wonder whether you might want to say a little bit more about what kind of examples there are and what lessons we could learn at Kirklees for engaging with citizens about strategic reform of, 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 of governmental arrangements. Right, yeah. Um, uh, that's a, a big question. There are probably quite a few levels on it, aren't there? There's, mm. there's, oh, well, that's fine. Um, one is to strengthen the representative structures so that we've got the, the councillors in the room with us this morning giving time and effort to represent different interests in, in, in the locality. Enormously important role, often undervalued, but supporting councillors, and this is a message back to the parties as well, isn't it, about trying to bring new talent into our into our political bodies. Um, I really think that's so important, and I think we we, we do support councillors up to a point. But it, I, I think I could make a case for giving more help to councillors, and I think that varies internationally. In some places, there's more resources perhaps available for councillors to support councillors in their work uh, than, than we have here. But I think you're speaking to the what I would call the participatory democracy that needs to go alongside the representative democracy. Mm. These these two ways of looking at democracy and what intention. Sometimes people think, oh, they are they're in conflict. I don't agree with that at all. Uh, representatives are keen on participatory models and bringing different voices in. Um, I think the Portland. Uh, experience and that Portland Public Engagement Guide is is one to have a look at. What they, they've got a very long tradition of community activism in the city, so it helped the city region, perhaps, but certainly the city. So that sort of helps them. There's a there's a fairly active citizenry in the first place, but um, that aside, they I think they've been quite good in. And some of this is on the well, quite a lot is on on the web, the Metro web. They actually give very clear and accessible advice to help community members engage with the Metro and with the staff who are serving the Metro and also there's some federal involvement as well. So um, it's, it's trying to demystify what this Metro is and making it very open and I think this, the, these active citizens have picked up on that. So there's lots of public hearings, lots of debate. It's quite a lively politics in, in, uh, in Portland. Um, it's unusual in the US for being quite green. It's probably the greenest city uh, in the US. They were on to eco-friendly policies a very long time ago. So the, some, the politics of the city help it a bit, I suppose. I'm trying to say it's not just the publication mm. of a nice guide to help people. But I'm, uh, I've been good. I think the officers working there are very good at working with their members and with community interests. And that's a very important lesson for uh, public servants as well. And then perhaps the last thing that I don't know so much about, but I think you, you are looking at this, Andy, in the Commission, is, is the use of social media. I think mm. there could be some quite interesting steps forward there. There's been hopes expressed about that before, and they've been a bit 
the outcomes have not been that great, but I, I think we have to keep going on that and see, see if we can improve the use of social media in local governance. Mm. Now that's enormously helpful. I mean, we certainly will look at the guy. We certainly will you know, look through that. Jen, sorry. No, no, sorry. Oh, right. uh, just to sort of push that on further then, um, because um, one of the clear issues has been, and it, it, you know, you raised there, is about the idea of bringing through new um, councillors. How do we bring through the next generation, so to speak, of councillors? From your um, experiences looking at other international case studies, are there any examples there you could offer about how other um, combined authorities and local authorities are engaging and bringing through that next generation? Right, that is a good question. Um, it's a good one, and nothing springs straight away, so that suggests that it's new territory, doesn't it, I think? Mm. Um, I think you've got... Uh, I think a lot depends on the, the, the local politics of place. I think this is sort of quite encouraging. Different places can invent different ways of doing things, and that's healthy. In Auckland, just as a little example, I think this is quite good. You've got a very strong Maori community that's historic and has been neglected. So you've got a disadvantaged group that's an uh, important part of society that's not being heard very well. So they, uh, they did toy with the idea of having seats on the Auckland Council purely for Maori representatives, if mm. you can imagine that, sort of just, we've got to bring out the, bring these people, and some of these are to make younger Maori as well. They don't actually go that far, but they've created a board, uh, uh, I forget the name of it now, but it's like a, a, a Maori board that's got special status within the governance of the city, and it advises the mayor on any issues relating to Maori concerns. And it's Mayor, uh, Mayor Brown has decided to use that model with other groups. So young people, I think uh, it might be elderly residents too, but these, these both of, call them communities of interest, mm. who might not get represented through the geography elections very well, but need to be listened to. So that might be, that might be an avenue that could be looked at in Kirk Lees, where you might have one or two I don't know what you want to call them, boards, but uh, arrangements for, like, say, young people um, mm. to have a voice. It, here in Bristol, maybe this is a, a, an example to think about, uh, Mayor Ferguson introduced uh, youth mayors, so the schools elected when he was, uh, shortly after he was elected, two youth mayors, uh, one boy, one girl, from the schools to actually be the youth mayors, and then there's that, that, that's then developing more into a kind of youth parliament. Mm. And those you, the young people in that role, I think they serve for one year. They'd be six formers typically, and then they'd be getting experience. And obviously, George and Marvin Reese is the same. Is very strong on that, so they're given access to anything they want, attending meetings and also speaking at events. Mm. So um, I think there's quite a lot of new ideas here that could be tried out to reach groups. Who, uh, who perhaps wouldn't normally get it. Because you know the classic is the articulate and well-educated dominant debate, don't they? And some of the other voices get left out. That's enormously helpful. I must admit my experience in New Zealand is that that Auckland framework has transferred to the National Parliament as well, so they tend to bring through a lot of younger um, representatives in the National Parliament. Kirklees has maintained its Youth Council, which I think has been Admirable. You have a youth council, yes. do you? Mm. Yeah, I think it's admirable. Oh, yeah, yeah, considering the climate at the moment, you know, that it's uh, often a very easy cut to make. Um, I really do commend them for it. Um, but those are really helpful ideas. Uh, Eric? Uh, just on that line, perhaps in the, in the not-too-distant future, perhaps we could have a, a combined authority youth parliament. In that would be really interesting uh, yeah. proposition. Oh to have. Uh, I'm glad when you uh, started discussing councillors you didn't uh, start saying well we'll, we'll shoot councillors that have been on too long. <laughs> you know, you know. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> you know. Well thanks very much Robbie because I think uh, people that have been on uh, a number of years I think on councillors you have to have a, a, a balance I think between young people you know, constantly refreshed and people with experience I think that does help uh, with, with democracy in, in many ways because uh, uh, age is but a number I'm sure you agree I do, I do, I think that's right you do need 
uh, we, I think it's probably true that most councils are skewed age-wise to older people, so we need to rebalance, but we don't need to lose all that experience. We need it. We're very lucky in Kirklees, by the way. We have got quite a number of uh, younger uh, councillors uh, from all parties. Uh, Good. So in, in, in that way, we... we we're going that down down that direction that you speak about. Can I yes. just go back to um, um, elected mayors? Yes. Please, if you don't mind. Uh, and, and about a veto uh, of, of leaders, because in some areas, an elected mayor can have, as we touched on earlier, too much power. Yes. Uh, and leaders of proposed combined authorities are a bit wary of the mayor having too much power and they are demanding vetoes in certain areas. What do you think about that, Robin? Well, I think this is, uh, I think this is all up for discussion in particular places, and I, the easy answer is I think you should design, I say you collectively, uh, an arrangement that suits your situation. Um, so one size the, doesn't fit all? Absolutely, no. I think it, it, you, you can have the argument. I think you can make a, have a good debate, really, about you want the mayor, if you're going to have a mayor, to be effective. So you don't want to impose so many constraints on what the individual mayor can do that they're hamstrung and they can't really lead much and they can't really push, push things along. Um, so you, you, you need to be careful you don't have too many checks and balances. But on the other hand, you certainly don't want a situation where you can't control uh, the directly elected mayor at all. Uh, and I, I don't want to criticise George Ferguson uh, particularly. I mean, the mayor Ferguson things I've made a lot of things different in Bristol that are now helping Marvin Rees and the new councillors. So uh, it was because it, I think we needed a bit of a shake up. But I do think um, he, he did. Uh, he did really not pay attention enough to his councillors so that they then became voices against him. Uh, and it might even explain why he did not get re-elected uh, in May, because he wanted to be elected for a second term. But um, he hadn't won any threat with the councillors because he didn't value their role. And mm. in, in the constitution of the council, as it was under the localism act, he didn't actually have to. He didn't have to go to council meetings and he was held to account in a formal way. But he didn't really have to have to listen too much if he didn't want to. And he didn't at times. And that, uh, that created some conflicts that we perhaps could have done without. So uh, that's the long way of saying that do have a careful think through about the areas of responsibility you feel the mayor should be able to exercise on your behalf without undue constraint. But mm. uh, be, be, be sure about uh, the council of voice. The, the president of... Portland Metro might be a model to look at there. The, 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 this is not a directly elected mayor, but the president is, is a really powerful figure in Portland, very highly respected, but works collegially. And in the end, the, the, there's a vote. There's, I think there are five councillors, maybe six. Mm. And those, say, I think it's six, so you have those seven individuals. The mayor can't overrule the other six. There's got to be an agreement. Uh, sorry, the president can't overrule. So... Um, I, I think have a little think about what, what suits the local context and uh, uh, I, I think a, a very strong directly elected mayor with major executive power might not be the right model for mm. your part of the world from what you're saying. Because mm. oh. we, we had some uh, something similar to what you described uh, not too far away in Doncaster, you would probably remember that. Oh gosh, yeah, I've forgotten you. Uh, that wasn't a happy experience, I don't think, was it? No, not at all. Yeah, you were at loggerheads with, I think, just about every councillor on, that sat on the authority. Yeah. And took, took not a blind bit of notice of anyone. Right. Yeah, I've forgotten that, but you're quite right. That is, that is a very good example of how to get it wrong, I think. Yeah. yeah I think so in that, some senses, that, that, that was the personality of the mayor <laughs> came into, uh, uh, into play there, I think. Yes, he was come, I met him a few times, he was commungingly old. Anyway, I'm better not. But that plays mm. into the personality stuff, doesn't it? That yeah. you know, yeah. somebody yeah. who you think might do yeah. doesn't yeah. have their own skills. Yeah. Right, I just want to move things on slightly because one of the interesting things that you raised in your presentation with uh, reference to Stuttgart was yes. the, uh, the fact that they are using a proportional representative electoral system. Yeah. And one of the things that we are looking at is not only election cycles, which you've already made some very helpful comments on, 
but also other initiatives to try and encourage uh, greater public engagement with local democracy and hopefully through that uh, increased turnout of elections. And I wonder whether you'd like to say a few words about the experience of the effect of PR on the Stuttgart Council and any other initiatives you're aware of where local authorities or combined authorities have engaged in political reform, electoral reform to try and increase engagement and participation. Right, yeah. Well, we've, we've got um, quite a lot of use of proportional representation in local government, well, in central and local government, in continental Europe. And there are different models and different experiences. So it's probably a bit, if you're a bit kept up. Don't want to be too sweeping about saying, oh, it's a definite plus or a definite mm. backward step. I think you have to look at each model. Um, I do, I think in the um, voter turnout for the Stuttgart city region, I think it was about 53% mm. uh, in their elections. So that's, you could say, it's good because it's better than we tend to get in local government elections in uh, England. Uh, but it's actually, uh, 53 is quite a bit lower than you get in Scandinavia, mm. where they, uh, they all, well, it varies again, but in Sweden you have proportional representation. I did, I did some work with, this might make you, might, might, might raise a chuckle here. This is in Malmo in Sweden. I, I think of it as being the Liverpool of Sweden, if you go back, is the big <laughs> port uh, that the, the dockyard industries have gone now, and it's reinvented itself as a, as a, a service sector city, a multi-ethnic city now. But they were worried in Malmo, this is not that long ago, because voter turnout dropped below 70%. <laughs> <laughs> but different from uh, yes. in England. So that, you know, up, 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 no, 80% that would probably they, they'd expect, and it's dropped to 70 So they're worried about voter turnout there because of that. Um, that's not just PR, by the way. The powers of local government in Sweden are probably the greatest powers of any local government in the world. They, they do have enormous power at the local level. So they run all the Kirklees services and the health service in elected local government. Mm. So they have local income tax and they, uh, very few Swedes pay any income tax to central government. It, it's paid to the local level. So if you're looking for models of real devolved power, uh, Sweden might be a place to look. I mean, that would be mm. quite a long step from where we are in England, I think. So, um, I think the PR that plays problem. into that, and it does allow voices to uh, get elected that would not get through on the first past the post system. You know, the classic argument for PR is you do have a wider range of voices mm. in the elected assembly. We just explore that a little bit, um, Robin, because one of the things I've tried to do in the past is find out where income tax, um, cost, you know, vehicle excise duty, um, that goes, uh, that's collected in Yorkshire. It's very difficult to find that out at the local level. But if you think about personally, I mean, I, you know, my share of our council tax is about 500, 600 pounds. I pay right. several, you know, thousands of pounds in income tax every year. I've got a lot more control over the few hundred pounds and they have over a thousand pounds so, <laughs> absolutely yeah I that's mean, a good way of looking at it yeah and again i mean going back to what you're talking about business engagement historically there was very little incentive other than civic good about promoting business locally because all of the benefit from uh, business rates went to, back went directly to central government so yeah so that model of actually local people having control over the taxes that are collected locally is there any other way other no. places other than sweet but, Sorry. That, 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 oh, I think the line broke up a bit there, Andy, but uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Um, yeah, just one, we'll, we'll not be drawn to a close in a minute, uh, but just one thought, there's, I'm just listening to the discussion. Um, I think the scale of the public spending cuts that are hitting local government across England, and mm. obviously currently is as bad as anywhere else, I think, um, I think it's worth trying to get the word out about the scale of those cuts more or effectively. I'm not criticising Kurt Lees here, I think, mm. I've been, I think across the country, but I got some figures, uh, finance people in Bristol help me, and I think this is probably true everywhere. Just, just let me give you a couple of figures. 
This is central government financial support to Bristol City Council. In 2010, 2011, that year, it was 201 million. That was the, the total central government support. In 2019, this is 10 years later, it will be 45 million. So it's going from 201 million to 40 million in 10 years. That's a 78% cut. So um, I think that's probably happening to you as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's absolutely devastating. So it means you're having to uh, fire people, I think, or make people redundant, and maybe ways of doing it, but um, you're going to have to stop providing some important services. So that as we talk about devolution and whether these devo deals are strengthening local government, I think it's always worth looking at, well, what about these um, mm. public spending cuts that mm. are really damaging local public services? I, 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 think if the, I think the Commission needs to at least pay some attention to that context, don't you? There certainly is something about that. Obviously, there is, there, there is careful consideration of the political dynamics of such uh, debates, but uh, I, I think that one of the things that we are very certain on is that there is a correlation between government cutbacks on local government spending and its impact on local democracy. Um, as local government becomes less resonant in people's life, then they're less likely to possibly engage politically as well. Um, but yeah, certainly, no, I, think, I think that's a good, good honour. I was just thinking about uh, Jetta joining the council relatively recently. I mean, it's great that we've got new people willing to stand, but in a way, the, the, the folk for Jenna to do what some of her more senior friends around the table were able to do is a lot less because of the public spending cuts. So you can imagine why some local... Uh, potential candidates decide, oh, I don't think I will stand for council because the constraints on what we can do is so so strong. I'm not sure it's a good use of uh, my time. So I, I think that's a key issue for, for well, for, I think it's a key issue for the Commission, actually. Also, it needs to be included, I think. Well, thank you, mate. It's a very interesting point to make, and we, um, you know, we, we will certainly take that on. I am looking at the time, and I'm aware that uh, we are coming yeah, to the end okay. of our time. Um, just to sort of Conclude. Are we? Are we um, yeah. Yes, uh, I'd like to thank Robin too. Uh, uh, it's been excellent having this conversation, uh, Robin. Uh, just no, I've enjoyed it too. It's been really good. Uh, uh, excellent. No. And thank you for ra raising that point in, in a non-political way, because I think you're quite right. It does need to be included. Hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting no, it's, not, it's not a political point, it's about that's right. it's, 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 it's factual, isn't it? Uh, I think yeah. that's very much big. Just to sort of give you an outline of what we're doing from now on, Robin, it's, it's, it's the Commission's going to carry on taking evidence until um, the end of October in one form or another. We then are going to uh, go away and, uh, as, a, as a group, the Commissioners and the officers are going to consider the evidence that we've taken and draw up um, some conclusions. And a, a draft report will be then um, available. Now, what we're very keen to ensure is, is that sometimes these commissions tend to come and extract information from people such as yourself that are very kind to give you your time, but then often don't come back and have a second engagement about our conclusions before we uh, go on and publish. We're very keen to make sure that doesn't happen, and what we're wanting to do with anyone that's given the time to spend uh, with us and give their thoughts is to um, reconnect and re-engage when we get to that draft report stage. And we'd be very, very grateful if you might consider offering some thoughts on our initial uh, recommendations before we finally uh, go to publish the report itself. Yeah, no, that would be, that would be fine, Andy, no problem on that. But it, it also occurs to me you might want to have, maybe you've got this in plan, when might need some sort of event or launch event or public occasion when the findings are uh, publicised more widely uh, and we certainly will and some, one of, one of yeah, the things we've got some action lines on but that's the sort of thing that if, if I could get it into my diary I'd be interested to come up first as an event of that kind oh well, that's, that's very kind that's enormously that's kind to think about anyway no 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 we will certainly take you up on that that's a very kind offer and one of the things that's been really rewarding is that the LGA has got behind this initiative as well and that we have had you know a wide 
uh, a widespread support from you know stakeholders across local and national government, and we intend to make sure that um, that we disseminate our our report as widely as we can. And knowing your own networks and contacts, we'd be enormously grateful if you could help us yeah. in that work. Okay. Well, if I could just say once again, you know, congratulations on do, uh, getting the commission up and running and, and the work you're doing, and I. I I wish you well with it, and I, I think you're, you're going about this in a very effective way. Oh, that's very kind of you to that's very kind of say. Well, thank you very much for a very enjoyable and very lively and very engaging conversation this morning, Robin, and we shall, as I say, we shall be in touch in due course. Right. Okay, no problem. Take care.